So having said something about the importance of making mistakes, let me now do something that may well turn out to be a mistake. Although I don't think it is. We'll see. Back to the main thread then. How can I argue for the view I suggested a few minutes ago that moral and political judgments need to be considered in terms of whether or not they make sense? Well, let me take an example. It's what philosophers do. We usually proceed through example. My example, and of course this is no coincidence, is going to be what I actually do take to be a very curious phenomenon, an irrefutable moral principle, the only such moral principle that I know. And if I'm right about that, if, it's at the same time an example of moral knowledge rather than moral belief, and also an example of how that knowledge remains substantively negative. That's to say we know it's true rather than just believing it's true. But even when it's presented as a positive claim, as Kant certainly presents it, the knowledge it gives us is mainly negative. So here it is, the second formulation of Kant's categorical imperative, my favourite sen sentence in the history of Western philosophy. <coughs> Act in such a way that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of any other, always at the same time as an end and never merely as a means. Let me say that again, because it's a bit convoluted. Act in such a way that you treat humanity, whether you, in your own person or in the person of anyone else, always at the same time as an end and never merely as a means to an end. How could anybody deny that principle? This is something I've tried a few times. So far, it's always worked. I've never found anybody who can give me a genuine argument against that principle. <laughs> what does it say? Let's unpack it a little bit. Why is it so powerful? Kant tells us that to be a person, to be recognised as a person, and not just a member of the species Homo sapiens, is already to have a moral and political status. The status of something that is not here merely as a means to another's or our own ends. If you, a person, deny Kant's principle, then what you're doing is denying your own status as a person but it's that status as a person that enabled you to make the denial in the first place. So not only is Kant's principle undeniable, at least on pain of practical self-contradiction, but it seems to me to be what I want to call a negative principle. And by that I mean that while it's very hard to see exactly what it rules in, and lots of people from Hegel onwards have pointed that out, it's not difficult to see what it rules out. Again, that answers to what we already know. Of course it's very hard. It might even be impossible to say exactly how people ought to live. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how to live myself, let alone how anybody else should. Or what precisely our political arrangements ought to be. Of course that's difficult. But it's not particularly difficult to say a great deal about how not to live or about what our political arrangements ought not to be. And of course, this is where capitalism comes in. Let's see how this rough theoretical framework might help us show what I claim all of us in this room know already, whether we know that we know or not, namely that capitalism is indeed immoral. That's what I'm going to try and do. To begin, and of course this is only a very small beginning, to persuade you that you know that capitalism is immoral and that you know it's immoral simply because it contradicts Kant's principle. And I'm going to be quite crude about this because as I've said, I think Wittgenstein's right. This is the best way of trying out an idea to see if it might work. And the idea is this, there are three very simple steps. 
If Kant's principle is right, then capitalism's immoral. But Kant's principle is right. None of you have managed to, nobody else has managed to deny it. So capitalism's immoral. QED, basta, done. This is just the beginning, of course, an indication. So I'm going to focus, of course, not on the whole of capitalism, which would take days, but about something that I think is central to it. The fact that it's built on the supposition that selfishness inevitably underpins our exchange relations. And the point is very famously put by a brilliant philosopher, Adam Smith, when he said... It's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker, and those who know me will understand the significance of that triumvirate, <laughs> that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own self-interest. We address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love. Put it in more contemporary terms, those of the notorious Milton Friedman, one of the twin gurus of the neoliberal revolution that we're suffering from, Quote, there's one thing you can trust everybody to do. You can trust everybody to put his own interest above yours. Nice. That's the view that's at the heart of capitalism. People will supply others with what those others need, only if it's in their own interest to do so. Altruism won't give you your dinner. You could say, as so many apologists for capitalism have said, that self-love, selfishness, is given in human nature. And I'll come back to that claim that it's in human nature or part of human nature in a moment. Now, I'm not at all sure that there actually is a human nature that's simply given, Hobbes's view, outside structures and outside norms. At least, if by human nature you mean anything normative. On the other hand, if human nature is understood as just a biological observation, then that's fine. Human beings, given our biology, require what food, water, shelter, and so on. But of course, if that's all the human nature claim amounts to, then the moral and political questions remain of what's to be done about it. In contrast, altruism, selfishness, and all the rest of our moral characteristics, those that are not simply biological, seem, at least to me, to be acquired or to be learnt or to be the product of social structures and arrangements, arguably, at least on one interpretation, Rousseau's view. But if that's right, then human nature's plastic, malleable into this or that shape. Still, whatever you might think human nature is, or even if you think that there's no such thing as human nature, it remains one thing to say that this is how people do act and quite another to say that it's how they should act or ought to act. And what the butcher and baker do on Smith's account is not right. It's not right because to the extent that the butcher and the baker provide dinner out of self-love, they're treating their customers merely as a means to an end, namely their own livelihood. Capitalism requires us to be selfish, whether it takes us to be so naturally or not. So, for instance, while some theorists of the current neoliberal revolution think we are naturally selfish, all its practitioners are busy either ensuring that we remain so, thereby, by the way, contradicting their belief in human nature, or are busy recreating us to fit with that image. Think of your own experience over the last 15 or 20 years. 